So we're uh, discussing today um, what happens to your food, and this is a little bit of a deceiving title, How Does Food Become Energy? Because as we've seen before, matter cannot become energy, energy cannot become matter, but we always say we eat to get energy. We want to take a look at how that actually happens in you. Um, here are the types of energy as we have discussed before. We're specifically going to talk about uh, chemical energy. Chemical energy. And, and, and later on when we talk about photosynthesis, we'll be talking about the conversion of that to that. So a quick review. Uh, that energy is obtained from the sun. Plants do photosynthesis and convert sun energy to usable energy. And that usable kind of energy is chemical energy. It's chemical energy that we're going to spend time talking about. And we'll review that a little bit here today, too. Uh, animals like us eat plants, or we eat animals that eat plants. So we can either be the uh, first, we can be the primary consumer, or we can talk about primary consumers, or we can talk about secondary, tertiary consumers up the energy pyramid, how we get chemical energy. Chemical energy, remember, is the energy contained in the bonds between atoms. So we're specifically going to talk about a chemical called glucose today. Glucose is a molecule, has a ring structure. I'm just showing the carbon atoms. Glucose's chemical formula is C6H12O6. So I've only shown some of the chemical bonds. Remember when we draw a molecular structure like this, uh, we show the bonds as lines. What they really are is covalently shared electrons. And so if we break those bonds, we break apart the molecule, energy is released. In this forest fire over here, the energy is being released as heat and light. The key to humans and the key to all living things is that we are able to capture that energy and not have it just burn. Here it's released as what we call free energy and energy that won't be usable really by anything. The key in organisms is that it's captured to use. So the process, so the what organisms do is the chemical energy is captured in the form of something called ATP. ATP is a molecule. It's the molecule of energy in cells. It's called adenosine triphosphate is ATP. And essentially, you eat food and your cells create ATP. And we're going to talk about that creation in this lecture. You use the ATP, and the ATP is oxidized, converted to something called ADP, which is a low energy form. With a little food, you re-energize. And we show that kind of idea here in this diagram, that ATP is sort of like a rechargeable battery. The charged version is ATP. The uncharged version is ADP adenosine diphosphate, meaning two. And um, so we recharge our batteries by eating, and it recharges our ATP. So what we want to talk about today is how that happens in a little bit of detail. And the process by which that happens is called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is also called internal respiration. We've talked about external respiration. After your food is digested and brought to cells by blood, it must be converted to ATP. And again, this is not necessarily, this sounds wrong, food converted. Okay, what this really means is that we have to break the food apart, break the molecules apart, and get, convert the chemical energy in the food to ATP. And, um... This happens, remember, in the mitochondrion. Back in sixth grade when you did your, uh, or whatever grade, you do cell model projects and you build cell models. And the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. Okay? That's because this is where you create or make ATP, cellular energy. The chemical formula for this... Uh, equi reaction is down here. Here are the pr here are the reactants. Glucose, which is a carbohydrate, but for the purposes of 
um, learning about it, we use just carbohydrate, just the carbohydrate glucose. Fats and proteins can also be, you eat fat and you eat protein, and those can be converted, those can be broken apart into energy also in a slightly different way. We use oxygen molecules. So these are the reactants, right? We put these together, the react, to produce carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. Okay? We breathe this out. We sweat or urinate this out. And we use that. So cellular respiration happens in the mitochondria. And here's a picture of a mitochondria in here. There are three stages to cellular respiration. Glycolysis, which actually happens if this is a giant cell around the mitochondria, and I, mitochondrians aren't this big in a cell, they're very quite smaller. Glycolysis is happening out here. Okay. The Krebs cycle and electron transport, also known as ATP formation, are happening inside the mitochondria. You see these little, uh, these little circles here, that's showing the Krebs cycle. And then along this membrane, the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, is where uh, electron transport and ATP formation happens. So glycolysis literally means sugar splitting, or to split sugar. And glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose to a molecule called pyruvate. It takes, it's a 10, there are 10 chemical reactions that happen all in a row. And those 10 chemical reactions produce enough energy, a little bit of energy, two ATPs, and something called NADH. And I wrote here energy taxi. What that means is essentially that when you take, remember we said that a glucose molecule is a ring structure. You know, it can, can, be a, can be a line linear too. It doesn't matter. If you break this chemical bond, energy is given off. What is that energy? Well, it's actually electrons. High energy electrons are captured. And this thing... NADH carries those high energy electrons from outside the mitochondrion to inside the mitochondrion. The other thing that travels from happening outside the cell is this pyruvate. Pyruvate diffuses into the mitochondrion. So we've broken glucose apart into two pyruvate molecules. They travel into the mitochondrion, and they go into something called the Krebs cycle. A Krebs cycle only, now of course, we're going to come back to this idea, but we're going to start with the idea that if, if you have oxygen present. Okay, so glycolysis happens out here. Pyruvate goes into the mitochondrion, and if we have enough oxygen, if your breathing is keeping, if we're talking about humans, your breathing is keeping up with what you're doing, which it is right now as you're sitting here watching this, um, unless you're doing P90X along with it or something, uh, you are sending uh, pyruvates into the mitochondria to do the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle is a rather complicated uh, process of eight chemical reactions. Uh, where pyruvate is pulled apart. Okay, those chemical bonds between the carbons are broken. We're creating more energy taxis by grabbing electrons and putting them on here. Something else that's another energy taxi, grabbing electrons and putting them in there. And then carbon dioxide, the release of these carbon atoms, along with a couple of oxygen, is waste. And what happens there is they're created diffuse out of the mitochondria into the cell, out of the cell into the blood, and as we've seen previously, out uh, in the lungs. So what we've produced now is we've produced these things that are carrying the high energy electrons. They're going to go from in here over to this membrane. On that membrane is a place called electron transport. Electron transport is a pretty, is kind of what it sounds. The electrons are dropped off at the inner membrane here 
and they're passed along, and we're looking at this, this picture down here, they're passed along through a series of molecules that are, this is a membrane here, maybe you can tell the two layers, passed along the series of molecules, and it's kind of like a hot potato, where you take a potato out of the oven, you pass to somebody, it's really hot, you pass along, pass along, pass along, and after it gets to the end of the line, it's cooler. Why is it cooler? Well, all the heat energy that was in the potato is now in people's hands and in the air. Well, as, this is, as these energy electrons are passed along, they lose energy. And the energy they use, uh, the NADH and FADH2 carry high energy electrons to the electron transport where they are converted to ATP. The electrons aren't where, this is not quite right, their energy is used to make ATP. Now, electrons are things. What happens to them? Well, the oxygen you breathed in is used in the mitochondria to pick up those electrons with a couple hydrogens and form water. So the, the electrons now have been passed along, passed along, passed along, and they're dumped, essentially, picked up by oxygen, and used to form water. So, what does this all mean? Well, to summarize then, in glycolysis we made two ATPs. The Krebs cycle, two more ATPs were made, and we made six carbon dioxides to give off. Electron transport, 34 ATPs are made for a total of 38. And I think I summarized that right here. Sorry about that. Per glucose molecule, 38 ATPs, 6 carbon dioxide, and 6 water molecules. There's some argument in this number amongst biologists. Some people say 36 ATPs because they don't really count the two ATPs made during glycolysis. But for what it's worth, for every glucose molecule, 38 ATP, 6 carbon dioxide, and 6 water if you have enough oxygen to run the reactions. Okay? And that's a super important idea. So, what, so the next question then is what if we don't have enough oxygen? And I want you to look at this diagram a second. This is, and this is not something to really write down. Here are the world records from track and field just for the sprint events for men. And uh, Usain Bolt holds the two, uh, the fastest man in the world, theoretically, uh, because we really don't know the heck, because maybe there's a faster guy that doesn't run track. Um, 9.58 seconds, Usain Bolt ran the 100 meters in. 19.19 seconds, he ran the 200 meters in. Now that makes sense, because this number is almost exactly two times that number almost right to the tenth to the hundredth of a second. Okay, I think it's actually three hundredths of a second slower, which who knows what could have happened there to cause that. By the way, this is just the wind speed, uh, 0.9 helping and 0.3 hurting, um, which actually could tell you why that's three hundredths of a second slower. The 400 meter time, though, is 43.18, set by another guy, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and if you multiply this by 2, you'll notice that here you should get 38.38. And yet it's 5 seconds slower. And all the men that have ever run the 400 meters in the, and in Usain Bolt, I would guess, has run the 400 meters at some time, never ran 38 seconds. In fact, 43.18, 45 seconds was considered to be unbreakable for a long time. And then if I multiply this by 2, from 400 to 800 meters, you'll see that that is quite a bit bigger than that. This should be somewhere around 120, uh, 126, something like that. Just doing the math very quickly in my head. So my question for you is, why is that? Why is it that as you run farther, you can't run as fast? Why can't the fastest person in the world run the 800 meters exactly eight times faster than he ran the 100 meters? Well, and you all kind of instinctively know that the real problem here is there's not enough oxygen. The longer you run, you can't breathe fast enough to keep up 
And so what happens in your muscles is something called fermentation. If we talk about yeasts, they produce alcohol and they do fermentation. Maybe that's where you've heard fermenting before. In your muscles, lactic acid, also known as lactate, is produced. And the thing with this is you have 19 times less ATP made per molecule, per molecule of glucose than you do when you have enough oxygen. So if we look over here at this little flow chart, glucose comes in and you do glycolysis all the time in your cells outside your mitochondria, no matter how if you have oxygen or not. Okay, and that's kicking out two ATPs. Glucose produces pyruvate. Pyruvate goes into the mitochondrion with enough oxygen, goes into the mitochondrion and produces 34 to 36 more ATP with a Krebs cycle and electron transport. But now you're running and you're in your first lap, you get past the 200 meter mark and you start running out of oxygen. Now your muscle cells do fermentation and they produce lactate. Because there's not enough oxygen, it doesn't go into the mitochondria and go to the Krebs cycle. It goes directly into uh, enzymes that break up the pyruvate, convert it to lactic acid. Your body will have to use more oxygen to take lactic acid and convert it back. So these men that are running the 800 meters, which is two laps, they cannot sprint. They could not possibly, Usain Bolt could not run 9.58 for every 100 meters because physiologically we can't keep up with the oxygen demand. Okay, you'd have to have a superhuman lungs, etc., to be able to do that. So that's our summary of energy use by cells.